Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it's always a uh, pleasure to see the Friends of Liberty packing the room of this size, and uh, I'm always uh, uh, coming back to my home, being encouraged by the spirit of others who are um, also sharing the same values as, uh, as myself. What I'm going to do I will add up a little bit on Adam's introduction on myself. Let me start with uh, uh, what was said to rephrase it maybe and to introduce myself in uh, three sentences. In the beginning of 90s I founded with my friend uh, the F.A. Hayek Foundation Free Market Economic Think Tank and Do Tank that was aimed to accelerate the transformation and transition of, at that time, Czechoslovakia and later Slovakia from centrally planned economy to the market economy. Then, in the end of 90s, I uh, spent some time, and in the, in the beginning of this century, I spent some time as the Chief of Strategy at the Ministry of Economy, where I had the opportunity to implement some of the liberal ideas I was uh, promoting many years earlier in the 90s and to turn them into structural reforms. And I must say that uh, we uh, had achieved uh, quite a success as uh, compared to the Slovakia of that time with the neighboring countries. And finally, uh, as of today, since 2003, I am a president of the Entrepreneurs Association of Slovakia. That is, uh, uh, my, my role is to defend interests of Slovak businesses, both uh, domestically and uh, at EU, at international level as well. And uh, what uh, I am doing today, the most of my time, just uh, brief information on the Entrepreneurs Association of Slovakia that was established in December 1989 as the first organization of private businesses in modern history of Slovakia. And uh, we can call it the Free Market Business Association. I think uh, now it's okay. Uh, and you know that many business associations are not the good friends of the free markets. They all are looking for the benefits for their own members, for the companies, for the industry, etc. So if there are some sort of enemies of the free market, the most powerful ones are in the business sector. So having the free market business association, it's a little bit like having the, the black swan. We are not very typical business uh, association. And just to give you a bit more flavor on that, I will show you our three priorities we have for Slovak presidency of the EU. I am not sure if everybody knows, but in the EU it's every six months one EU member country that is presiding over the EU Council. And now it's turn of Slovakia to be the presidency country of the European Union. And these are the three political priorities of my business association for that uh, presidency. What we want to see in Europe is uh, more structural reforms and less centralization. We want to see more entrepreneurial freedom and less bureaucracy and less regulation and more entrepreneurial spirit and less big investment projects like Juncker's investment plan that uh, is aimed to promote entrepreneurship, but uh, at the end of the day, it is damaging entrepreneurship. So this is uh, what I do uh, today. And uh, I am going to give you a brief uh, introduction to what I think is the most uh, pressing problem in Europe uh, today. What I want uh, to do is to try to 
answer the three very crucial questions today for Europe. One, if we want to be successful, we need to understand the foundations of our success so far. And that's the question how Europe got rich. The second question, of course, we are rich as compared to the rest of the world, but we are facing the serious problems and there are signs of decline. They are visible everywhere around us. So why Europe faces decline will be the major part of my presentation. Uh, and finally, what should be done to get Europe back on the track? It's the, the final part final part of that. So let me start with the first question. How Europe got rich? And uh, maybe a good question for you is uh, how many of uh, the people sitting in this room are actually economists? Please raise your hand. Fortunately, economists are in minority. <laughs> in this room but so I tried I am economist myself by background and uh, mostly the presentation deal is, deals with the economic issues but also with a little bit of uh, politics uh, but economics is uh, the very basic uh, uh, of that and if you are economist you have no troubles in reading the chart if you are not the economist you need a little bit of explanation what you see on the chart is basically the ice hockey stick. You know the ice hockey? You know the shape of the ice hockey stick? It's very much flat and then suddenly there is a curve. And what we see is the data that were collected by one interesting British economist whose name was Angus Madison. And Angus Madison was uh, uh, cooperating with the OECD, Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. And he was uh, doing enormous job of collecting statistics on prices, population, incomes from history of the human uh, race 2000 years backwards. So he basically based on these statistics produced the information about the population and the GDP over the time frame of basically the last 2000 years. So what you see on that chart is that when it comes to the GDP, which is the measure of the size of the economy, uh, the world was pretty much stagnating or was growing but at a very low space. See that from the year one of this, uh, uh, after the Christ uh, and until today. And there was something happening around 1800. And after 1800, you see enormous acceleration of uh, the growth rates, enormous acceleration of incomes, enormous acceleration in terms of both growing population and uh, growing economies. And the crucial question is, what was behind this enormous acceleration? And when we search uh, the answers among uh, many uh, scholars, you see many different uh, uh, explanations for that. You have, for example, German sociologist Max Weber, who said, well, Europe got rich because of the work ethics associated with uh, Protestantism. So the Protestants were, you know, on, not only believers, but they were hard-working people and thanks to that Europe got rich. There is something in that uh, explanation, but it's only part of the, of the puzzle. We have the other scholars answering the same question and uh, that probably the largest part of the scholars agree that the answer is institutions. What matters for the economic development is institutions. And probably the, in the best way it was described by uh, Nobel Prize laureate for economics, Douglas North, who said that uh, in Europe we succeeded in 
making transition from natural state of a slow growing economy, small or relatively centralized government that was very important, operating without consent of the governed and social relationships organized along personal and dynastic lines. So that was the state of the Europe for more than 1,500 years. And the result was stagnation. And then, after 1,500, especially around 1,800, what we have seen was the economy started to grow faster, and it was according to the Douglas North, because there was a more decentralized government and social relationships were governed by impersonal forces like the rule of law involving secure property rights, fairness and equality. So rule of law, property rights, institutions important for the economic growth. Uh, the, there was another important economic historian, I don't know if you are familiar with the Niall Ferguson, British historian, who said that the major turning point was uh, 1689 Bill of Rights, as was set out, that was setting out the rights and liberties of the subject, as defined the protection of individuals from arbitrary expropriation by the Crown. So he saw the very clear link between the what was called the glorious revolution in Britain and the economic growth and the industrial revolution. Uh, I wrote a paper, I don't know if you have the available that paper or not. If you have that available, you have the other economists and historians, they are quoted there, uh, including the Daron Asemanaglu, who is the uh, historian or the economist who again says that the success of Europe is thanks to the institutions. Uh, but my favorite economic historian, number one, is American economic historian whose name is Deidre McCloskey. And the interesting thing about the Deidre McCloskey is that it used to be the Donald McCloskey. I don't know if you are again familiar with the McCloskey. Uh, the, uh, I like that guy who is now the lady because it's very intelligent uh, economic historian who has a sense of humor and who I think find, found the best answer to the question why did it all start at first in Europe? And his answer is very quick, or the very short, saying the answer in a word is liberty. By, and again, very important, by certain accidents of European politics, having nothing to do with the deep European virtue, more and more Europeans were liberated, and the coupling of ideas in the heads of the common people yielded an explosion of betterments. And uh, Donald, uh, Deidre McCloskey calls this uh, period after 1800 the great enrichment. That is the great accumulation of uh, wealth in Europe. And again, if we don't want to be, it's, it's always good if someone reminds us to be humble a little bit. Because it, I know I want to underline what he says, or what she says that uh, it is not European virtue. It is not because we were Europeans we built the successful and rich part of the world. It is because we honored certain values and we built some institutions based on these values that made us successful. And if the, in the other parts of the world will honor the same set of values and will build the same set of institutions, they can have the same successful track record as Europe between 1800 and uh, today. Then, if uh, we now understand that it was liberal set of values, individual freedom, and then institutions built on them, like limited government and uh, the uh, free markets, 
the important institutions, they need to be in place if we want to be successful from economic point of view. Uh, why Europe faces decline today? And I have two parts of the explanation for that. One is what Niall Ferguson, I mentioned earlier, economic historian, calls great reconvergence. Well, it is China that is coming basically back. And again, we, we see the chart covering 2,000 years of our history, and it is comparing the size of the economies of the eight countries of the world, China, India, Japan, US, France, Germany, Italy, and Britain. And what we can see from the chart that economies of these eight countries over 2,000 years always represented either uh, 60 or 70 percent of the world GDP. But what is important is relative size of these economies. And as you see from the chart, I don't know why this doesn't point. Do we have a laser pointer here or not? Probably not. Uh, you can see from the chart that China and India dominated the world. These two economies dominated the world first 1800 of, uh, uh, after the Christ, until 18, uh, 1800. And after 1800, the size of the China and uh, India steadily declined over the time. And in the 20th century, after 1970, both economies started to regain their original size uh, as a share of the world uh, economy. And it's again important as a reference to what I said earlier, why the China is coming back, especially when you see that after 1970. The people were saying, well, uh, so Chinese communists were not stupid as uh, the communists in the other for, uh, former communist countries and they kept the good parts of the socialism and they started to manage the economy more successfully and that is why they are now successful. But we know that it's not the truth. We know that after na when they made these efforts of the great leap forward the Chinese uh, transition ended up in uh, ruins. So after, in the end of 70s, in the beginning of the 80s, and especially in the 90s, they started to liberalize their economy. In other words, they started to use some of the wisdom we uh, used successfully in Europe after 1800. So the China is today successful and is coming back not due to or thanks to the socialism they still have there, but thanks to the fact that they open their economy and they basically use uh, some of the liberal policies uh, they have uh, successful consequences. And the result is of course that uh, the China is uh, growing uh, and India are growing much faster and of course the part of that is uh, that was uh, the answer given by one American economist whose name is Tyler Coben. Tyler Coben is the American economist who admires the Austrian school of economics and he says that the part of the slower growth of the developed world is that we have already collected low-hanging fruits of the economic growth, that we've made our uh, growth thanks to the using the sort of quantitative factors, that we have uh, uh, now, we are at the stage when we need to find the factors, the qualitative factors that will help us uh, grow again. And it's easy to understand that if I am, for example, a jumper in the athletics, it's easy for me to improve if I have a personal record of one meter and 90. 
and I can improve myself by 10 centimeters every year. But if I am at the level of 235, I can improve only centimeter by centimeter. So there is the objective explanation why Europe is growing slowly, more slowly, and why the other countries that are catching up are growing uh, faster. But that's only the first part of the explanation. My second part of the explanation, and that is the major part of my presentation, is that uh, in addition to the objective long-term trends of the other parts of the world catching up with us, there is our own mistakes. We are sort of shooting ourselves into our own knee by many, many mistakes. And I will name some of them. The end result of this mistaken uh, recipe is that in Europe, when you see country by country, the most typical picture you get is that we are the economies with the high public spending, high tax and social security burden on citizens and on businesses, what, which means high rate of redistribution, that government takes a large part of the economy, the, the financial resources from the economy, from the citizens and businesses, and it is redistributing that through the political process, and then high regulatory and administrative burden these are all elements of this uh, dominant policy default in Europe. And uh, uh, in one sentence, I would say that this mistake uh, behind it is that for many decades in Europe, we have the system of uh, wealth redistribution that is dominating over the system of wealth creation. Europe became rich because it had a good system of wealth to encourage the system of wealth, wealth creation. But the 20th century was basically the century when we were obsessed, our politicians are obsessed with the wealth redistribution. The, these are the couple of the charts that are illustrating what I was just saying. When you look at the EU and compare it, which is on the left of the first chart, and compare it with, for example, the China and India, you see on the chart that it's really true that total tax burden as compared to the economy is much higher in Europe than in the rest of the world. When you see the second chart, upper right corner, second chart says again, the Europe is the blue columns, that the tax wedge, which means the proportion of the taxes the government takes out of your wage, is much higher as compared to the rest of the world. And unfortunately, it is not about only taxes and social security contributions as the way the government collects the money. The government uses many other sort of hidden ways how to take money out of the businesses or the citizens. And one of them, for example, is that it, use, it uses the regulatory policy to influence, for example, energy prices. So you see again the blue part of the curve on this uh, chart. And it is the energy prices in Europe as compared only to the US. And you see that in Europe we have much higher energy prices as compared to in the US and much higher than in China, of course. And one of the reasons and explanations is that the governments are using the part of the energy prices that are artificially high to subsidize and to use that money to to make expenditures uh, that would not be able to do if they would not be able to collect money this, this way. And uh, the end result of all these negative factors is that uh, the attractiveness, and that's the final chart on this slide, 
the attractiveness of Europe as the destination for investment is declining. And you see that uh, uh, the, the upper curve on that chart, that's Europe, that's, uh, the amount of investments that ended up in uh, a European Union. And you see that the red uh, curve is declining uh, heavily as compared to the other worlds, to the other parts of the world. And the again explanation is it is because the we are losing economic and international competitiveness as the uh, in context of the other parts of the world. So how is that possible that we started with the ideals of uh, the liberal values that were used as uh, the foundations for building our institutions? protection of property rights, limited government, etc., etc. And we ended up in the completely different world, as I described that uh, just two minutes ago. I have uh, four explanations for that. One of them is, uh, what is the narrative in the minds of the people uh, today? Second, about values. Third, about institutions. And fourth, about politics. So let me go through all of them. Uh, when we see the today and we are the exchanging the views with the, with the people, we see that the people are, in my understanding as the economist, having very distorted understanding uh, of what kind of world they are living in today. My understanding and my all data I know from all economists they are collecting this uh, that we, especially in Europe, we live in the best world ever from material, from economic point of view. That's definitely true for my country, Slovakia. We never ever had a, such a good life as we have today, um, but there is a paradox. Despite that fact, and the data are confirming that, people don't share that view. People believe that uh, that's not true. People believe that they are living in the, in the hell, in economic and social hell. And that not only that, they believe that this hell, the reason behind that is evil liberalism. It is the free markets, free trades, globalization, all kinds of stuff that was invented by liberals that are now damaging our economies, our societies, that is damaging the environment, our planet. And uh, when you see uh, all kinds of uh, beliefs, I listed on this chart a couple of them. Unregulated capitalism caused a major financial crisis we are facing today. I would say if we would conduct opinion poll, not in this room, but among population, maybe 90% of the people would sus subscribe to that. Rich are getting richer and poor are getting poorer. Maybe 100% of the people would subscribe to that, despite the fact that it's not true. That's not true. And again, uh, in the paper, you have references to a couple of uh, books written on that. Matt Ridley is a great uh, British uh, science writer who collected all kinds of data, saying that uh, if we compare our lives today, and it was also the Deidre McCloskey saying, the great enrichment of 200, last 200 years means that Every individual living today on the planet has uh, increased wealth as compared to every individual living on the planet in 1800 by a factor of 10. In the most developed countries, that factor is 30. So our life is 30 times better today in developed part of the world than it was uh, in the past. And it is not only true about those who are rich. It is the truth, especially for those who are by statistics today considered to be poor. So it's not that rich are getting richer, but also poor are getting 
richer. But despite that, we can prove by data that it's true, the people will stick to the statement rich are getting richer and poor are getting poorer. And then multinational companies, many people believe that, well, that's the source of evil. They are conspiring against the public interest. People believe that pharmaceutical companies, they keep the drugs against the cancer secret. Then they not are giving it to the general public because they want to make profits. Then free trade, which is one of the major source of our prosperity in the previous two centuries, is today viewed by our fellow citizens as a new form of colonialism, exploitation of small countries by large companies. We have that debate with, uh, in the context of TTIP, as it was uh, shown yesterday during our dinner speech. And of course, uh, we can go and on, on and on and says that uh, environment degradation, people believe that reached catastrophic dimensions. And this is the problem that uh, what I would say that uh, the, if there was the fight in the media over the meaning of the certain important values, we must unfortunately say that opponents of liberalism successfully managed to damage the reputation of core liberal values and uh, damaging liberalism itself by referring to it as an evil root of all economic, social and political problems of the world. Uh, and as a consequence, the terms like capitalism, liberalism, markets, free trade today are used as the sort of word of uh, abuse. It was Samuel Britton who wrote in Financial Times several years ago, I became infuriated when those who take a more laissez-faire attitude, for those who are not economists, laissez-faire attitude, it's those who are supporting the free market, are described as to the right of the Genghis Khan. So this is the image we have today in the eyes of the general public and it looks like this and unfortunately unfortunately the that very perception is typical for the citizen of the european country which is the voter and you can you imagine someone who is having the idea of liberals, liberal politicians, liberal programs, liberal policies like this, coming to the uh, elections and voting for political parties? Impossible, you know? So that's very important. This was about the, this negative narrative people are living in and about the values and the ideas. Let me say also a couple of words about these institutions. And if you look at our institutions, you see enormous negative transformation from what was once limited government to what is today the welfare state. And let me show you the two charts I show from time to time to my students at the Summer School of Economics. I'm organizing with the Hayek Foundation for already 21 years the summer school of liberal economics and I use this chart to demonstrate to students what happened in Europe it should be the in the economic textbooks as the most scary chart in the history of uh, economics why it is scary why is it scary some economists can you can you tell to our friends who are not economists what do you see on that chart? We see selection of a couple of countries, Japan, US, Great Britain, Germany, Sweden, and we see these countries over the 100 years, since 1880 until 1980. What happened over this 
time. What happened is that while in the beginning of that period the government was still limited in its size, it was spending only about one tenth of the economy. Sorry? Can you, can you explain what the uh, uh, numbers mean? Because it's not it's this is, explanatory. This is what I'm trying to say, yeah. That what we see here is that in, when we look at each of the countries, you see strong upward trend, strong increase. Increase of what? It's increase of, it's not on the chart. It's expenditure as compared to the size of the economy. So meaning that once in the beginning of that period, the governments were taking only less on average, less than one tenth, less than 10% of the sources from the economy were taking and collecting through taxes and other means and were having the public finances and the politicians were deciding how to use these public finances. In the beginning of that, it's still in the end of 19th century, it was less than 10%. In other words, if you were the citizen of that, in, in Europe, in these countries, the most likely your government was taking only every tenth, whatever the currency was it, currency unit from your income. And 90% of what you earned belonged to you. And then over 100 years, in 1980, the average rate of redistribution reached in some countries more than 40 and in some countries even more than 50 percent it was sweden in other words again after only 100 years the government if you are the citizens in the same country that once collected only one currency unit from tens of your income today is collecting four or five of your 10 units of your income. So it is taking more than or half or more of your income. And it's true. I am sure that if I would take any one from you, from any European country, if we would be able to uh, calculate all ways the government collects money, taxes, social security contributions, other mandatory payments, uh, and not only income and direct taxes, but also indirect taxes. When you, after you earned your income, it was taxed by the government. Your employee, employer was taxed, and you go buying something, you pay the taxes again. If all that is calculated, I'm sure that in every, uh, the most, ma last majority of the countries of Europe, we would end up with the result that the government is actually taking more than 50% of what you earn and collect that and the politicians, not you, are spending this money. It's enormous change, enormous change. So it is today we are far, far from the limited government. We are at the stage when the government spends the money through different uh, mechanisms than the individual decision. Uh, and the second chart I show to the, my students is, again, it's not scientific, it's just uh, approximation, but it again says the expenditures we spend are growing over the time uh, through the government in all countries in Europe. And when we look at the structure of that money, we see that what was originally uh, the expenditures associated with the limited government, which is public administration, courts, etc., defense, are more or less the same as used to be during the last hundred years. But what is different is this social security, education, and other 
expenditures, what I call the welfare state, and what is the typical trend in Europe, this, uh, we had in the eastern part of the Europe socialism, in the western part of the Europe they had, and they still had the welfare statism, meaning the big state that is redistributing the large proportion of the incomes generated by the economy and spending it on pensions, on social benefits, and on other things that in the past were the responsibility for individuals. <coughs> then, second, uh, my concern is not only about the growing the government in terms of the size, but about the second most important uh, invention of liberals, which is the checks and balances. You know that the important liberal contribution to the modern world was the principle of strict separation of the three powers, executive, legislative and judiciary. But when you look at the systems of our politics today, you see that over the time the system of checks and balances, both in the US and in Europe, is uh, becoming weaker and weaker. And when I see what the politicians are doing after elections, you can uh, say that this separation between executive power and other powers almost disappeared. So if you are the political party that is winning the elections, you have not only full control of uh, the executive power, but at the same time you have the full control of the legislative power, you have the full control of the parliament mostly, which is considered to be the norm today, but for me it is not. The legislative power should be in a position to put constraints on executive power, but this mechanism disappeared. Uh, that was the idea of to having the two chambers and the, the, the one chamber that would be controlled by executive, the other con the chamber that would be not controlled by the executive and that would be able to uh, limit the measures adopted by executive power. But this is not working. Executive power and legislative power almost merged today and the result is the growing government in its size without any limits. That's the two uh, very interconnected uh, things. And uh, when we see as the politics works today, we see this old principle of individual responsibility almost disappearing from politics. And the system of uh, the uh, coalition governments is helping to that. There are the political parties in most of the systems of Europe that need to form the coalition government with others if they want to uh, be in a power. But this act automatically means that they need to uh, compromise on their pre-election promises. But this means that it is giving them excuse to their voters that they will not implement what they promised. And they have a good excuse for that because they can say, it's not we were cheating, we were lying you, it's because of the public interest. We need to form the government, this country needs to have some sort of government, and to have the government means that, well, we will not have a flat tax, we promised to you, because the other coalition partners don't want to have the flat tax, so we will give up on that but we want to form the government. So by the system of the coalition governments, you are having the system of collective irresponsibility replaced by very old principle of the skin in the game. That if I say something, I should be hold, held accountable for that. In, if I not deliver my promises, I, I need to pay the price. This is not the case anymore, and that the result is that people lost all trust in our institutions, in politics, in uh, government. 
the <coughs> let me continue on the politics what is typical today is the post truth politics as the term i don't know who was original the someone who came up with the first with that term but i think it's uh, the very relevant to describe today political system it is the system where i have the feeling being the dinosaur of the liberal movement over the last 25 years that it is less and less important the truth in politics and it is more and more important who is able to work with emotions of uh, the voters and the most powerful emotion of the voters is of course negative emotion which is the fear and uh, with the social media with internet and uh, with all this uh, access of information it is more and more difficult to for the people to identify what is truth and what is not so what the people do instead they like and share on social media all kinds of information irrespective if it's true or not that fits into their world overall world view and uh, as i described earlier i have a much uh, concern about the world view of the most uh, of our fellow citizens so it is basically this system that leads to the paradox what i see as the paradox if i would repeat again everything what i said about the richness of europe that today we have many arguments that liberals were right that their ideas they promote are having consequences and these consequences are positive for the everyday life of the people so liberals were never been so evidently right as today but the paradox is that uh, despite that we liberals were never ever been as hated as uh, we are today and unfortunately i think the especially those people they are in politics they did not pass this sort of test of their values successfully and in my paper i use the example of liberals in the european parliament that uh, liberals especially in politics today that are confronted with this negative attitude toward liberalism they are more and more are departing from core liberal beliefs and they are more and more willing to accept the values and the measures of their opponents the socialists so when i look at the documents of the liberals for example in european parliament and not only there in uh, slovakia in everywhere i cannot believe my eyes i see there many requests for the taxation for the regulation in european parliament you have the guy ferhofstadt who is the uh, propagating the european federation meaning centralization you cannot promote this and you cannot call yourself the liberal at the same time so what in fact we have today is we have leftists and socialists they are outright leftists and socialists and you have mostly people they call themselves liberals but they are de facto socialists so it reminds me the situation in the us many decades ago when they made this transformation as well when classical liberals confronted with the others were more and more willing to accept the uh, socialist or leftist ideas and to the extent that they own, they themselves became the leftists and socialist and the classical liberals sticking to their original message they started call themselves libertarians to differentiate them from the people using the term liberal but being de facto de facto socialists so what i see this uh, in europe unfortunately this uh, transition that is repeated from the us transition 
from classical liberalism to big government liberalism that is especially visible in, uh, in politics today. Finally, uh, let me conclude by spending a couple of minutes on what should be done to get Europe back on the track. Uh, again, there are, as Adam in his introductory speech today said, there are many books and uh, think tanks, uh, projects, etc., etc., et et saying what should be done. And of all of I've read, I thought the most relevant answer I found in the interview that was given by Thomas Messi, American Republican from Kentucky, in the interview for Reason magazine. And, we, and he said, when people ask me, will our children be better off than we are? I reply, yes, but it's not going to be due to the politicians, but the engineers. And I must say, I agree with that. The only change I would make into this statement is I would replace the word, word uh, engineers with entrepreneurs. With all respects to the engineers, it is not engineers themselves, but it is the entrepreneurs who are the real driving factor behind all kinds of, uh, all kinds of innovations. And why I like that quotation? Because I agree with the American Republican that he's skeptical about quick change that, was, that would be possible to make in politics. Uh, that if we want to see the change, the change will not come out from the politics itself. It will come out from the other parts of the society, from the entrepreneurs, from entrepreneurship that is uh, sort of aside from this ideological battle uh, and from uh, politics. And it is my favorite uh, topic because I am uh, the president of the entrepreneurs for many years. And uh, that is why I believe really that the, our societies can be changed positively only by entrepreneurial spirit. And the good news today is that it has never ever been so easy to, to start businesses today. Uh, despite the government growing in size, given, despite government regulations growing, these are the all problems for existing businesses. If you are running business, then you have all these problems with the big government and the regulation. But the starting business was never ever so easy. The only thing you need is to have the idea. Then you have the Apple or uh, the Android or whatever the world of applications that are there. That uh, if you have the idea, the whole world is, you know, here for you to to make money. So we have a uh, in Europe that is not typically good place for business. In recent years, there is a very positive trend. There is a wave of startup movement everywhere in all European countries. And we have quickly growing new generation of entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs. And what encourages me is that the most of them are not dependent on the government. We have many entrepreneurs, they make their business with the government. But those new generation of entrepreneurs, they are not independent on government. They usually do not think about the government at all and they develop innovative business ideas how to solve problems in the past were solved by the government. So they are not only sort of encouraging positive island there, but they can even be the source of reduction of the government in the future if their solutions will be widely shared. So, we are still trying to find a way what should be done to get Europe back on the track. <coughs> I was uh, making some critical remarks on liberals in politics. So, what in my view needs to be done, it's not 
stealing from socialists their uh, you know recipes but we should come back to this classical liberal message we should stop competing with socialists in their we will take care of you citizens and we should return to fundamental principles of classical liberalism but apply it in an innovative way in a modern context and especially we should be able not only to win these debates uh, on the rational argumentation because we are good at that if we if i would be sitting here with the socialists even with the nobel prize laureate uh, paul krugman i think i would be able to win the argument with the facts because the facts are on our side but what we are losing this battle is the, we are good in uh, persuading the brains of those who are open enough to listen but we fail completely to fight for hearts of the people this is my this is my point and we need to find a way how to fine tune our message in a way that will resonate in the hearts of the people so what what we need is the radical change but talking about politics i don't think uh, we can expect uh, the change from the politics soon and we cannot change the institutions we cannot decide from day to day that starting from tomorrow we will not have the welfare state we will come back to the limited government where the government redistribute only 10% it's impossible of course it's illusion uh, so we need to start to understand that it is the ideas that are having consequences and that our liberal ideas improve the, our lives and the other socialist ideas make it worse and here we are back at souls of the citizens and uh, remember that uh, picture with the nightmare that we need to change the image of the liberalism from negative to positive and only that will be the foundation for uh, for being more successful and in the Q&A I can tell you that it is possible to start this transformation even today and uh, very good example of that is Sweden I can come back to the uh, uh, Sweden example in the Q&A hey, what is my last slide is uh, what I did uh, several years ago for uh, my presentation at Mont Pelerin meeting society in Prague Mont Pelerin society is the World Association of the most prominent liberal-minded uh, thinkers, um, economists, uh, other scholars, lawyers, etc., etc., businesses also as, as well. And I conducted a small thought experiment. I wanted to look at our situation not only from this narrow uh, point of view of today, and I started to thought. To think if we can imagine the historian 200 years from now what if nothing will change what this historian would write about our current situation after 1989 in Europe it would not be long text because if you have the textbook or history textbook what is it written there about uh, today what, what is it written about 1816 not much what we remember what was the Europe like in 1816 so it should be short and it should be one paragraph and uh, my uh, expectation what would be this historian writing is as follows. The title would be Decline of Europe. And it is summarizing what I was trying to tell you throughout this my presentation. After 200 years of dominating the world, economically and politically, Europe lost its position relatively quickly due to newly emerging powers in the world economy, China and India and others, However, this process was significantly accelerated by Europe's own mistakes when economic and social systems of 
communist Eastern Europe first, and welfare statist Western Europe only two decades later ruined their competitiveness and both collapsed because of giving a wealth redistribution more priority over a wealth creation. This is the thought experiment and it sounds very pessimistic and it's not the, the, the reason is not that I want it to end uh, in this pessimistic tone. The reason is that I know what is the rest of your event, that we, you are going to brainstorm about the future and the future of freedom and I wanted to give you a food for thought. This is the today quite likely scenario. So for you, it is sort of incentive to think what should be done differently to uh, make different future for new Europe, not that, uh, that pessimistic one. What should we change in our societies, in our economy, in our public sector, uh, everywhere, in order to introduce the changes that will come, uh, return us back to the path of prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen.